get started with our next panel. Um, for any, or actually our next speaker. Um, for anybody who uh, doesn't know, this is Sandy Barber. She's a Penn State Athletic Director since 2014. Uh, just a really quick bio, undergraduate degree from, uh, from Wake Forest. Uh, stops at Northwestern, where she uh, earned uh, two master's degrees, uh, Tulane, Notre Dame, and Cal, uh, before coming to Penn State. So she's got a great pedigree, particularly the Notre Dame and Northwestern part. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, she, she, she's agreed to uh, she's agreed to come in and, and talk to us for a little bit. What I asked her uh, to do is um, she's going to um, give us just some of her thoughts on where we are as far as uh, Penn State Athletics, what's on her mind, and then we'll just open it up for questions. We've got lunch at noon, so that's what our, uh, our, our time limit is. So there we go. Please welcome Sandy Barber. For the panel of one, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, love, uh, I, I, I love the question I got, you know, what's on my mind? What's most important uh, to me right now? And uh, that was uh, that really helped me frame kind of some uh, some opening remarks here. Uh, and, and then obviously, as you all are, are want to do and are very good at doing, uh, then uh, they get getting the questions and, and hopefully some answers. But uh, you know, what's important? What's most important to me right now? Well, I would have to tell you that, that that's an easy question, and that's focusing in on our student athletes and our student athlete experience. Now, at particular times, there are different executions of that or different aspects of, of that that maybe are keeping me up at night or, 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 or are on my mind. But that's always the question. You know, how, how are we doing from a student athlete experience standpoint? What are the salient factors? What are we not doing so well? Uh, and then I would have to say the second piece of what's always on my mind is how do we resource that? How do we finance it? What are the what are what are the moving parts around our financial stability or our financial model? So I want to talk for just a, a, a few minutes of, about both of those, and uh, and then let you uh, let let you have at it. You know, student athlete success, our student athletes, their experience, creating a world class experience for them. That's our why. That's our purpose as as a university. It's for students in general. Um, as an intercollegiate athletics department at Penn State, our purpose, our why, is creating this world-class experience uh, for, for student athletes. And that's about the intersections of intercollegiate athletics and academics and the academy. One of the things I love about Penn State is it's very clear that students, and, and in our case, student athletes, make a decision about coming to Penn State based on those intersections. They want to have an opportunity to be a world champion, an Olympic champion, an NCAA champion, uh, go and play in the NFL or the NHL or the NBA or the WNBA or the W League or whatever it happens to be. And they believe that Penn State can help them do that, but they come here because they can do that and get a phenomenal degree, and have access to 650,000 living alumni, and all that accrues to them uh, because of those, those passionate alumni. Uh, it's about winning, but more importantly, it's about winning in, in, in life. So what are the things that are, that are on my mind uh, in terms of, of Penn State and where we need to get better? Because we're really, really good. We've always been very good. We've always been very good from the from valuing that and then resourcing it. Um, you know, I think that there are some places around student development from an intercollegiate athletic standpoint. Again, we're accessing and we're intersecting with all that our great campus has to offer to students. Uh, but one of the things that we've chosen to invest in uh, and, and, and beef up is our student development program within athletics around career development, around financial literacy, around mental health and, and, uh, and harm reduction. All of the things that are on the minds of, of populations of 18 to 22, and some of those things are exacerbated by whether it be the notoriety that they have as a student athlete or whether it be around the physical demands, uh, all of those kinds of things. Time demands. 
We hear it. It's it's the it's the buzz phrase now uh, in the NCAA. But it's about exactly what I've just been talking about: ensuring that student athletes have the time to to engage with the uh, the academic opportunities that they have on their campuses, and that intercollegiate athletics and their time spent on that is not preventing them from accessing, uh, accessing the education that's here. A lot of what, what you've heard, a lot of what you all as, as media have, uh, have, uh, have, have printed and have, have written about uh, is around things like student athletes not having an opportunity to engage in an international experience. Um, that's something, uh, frankly, that, that we're working on here. You heard about our, our baseball uh, Cuba um, trip. Um, that's those are the kinds of things that we that Penn State is really focusing on to try to do uh, from a fundraising standpoint. We're going to look at um, uh, at, at uh, endowing a program for each and every one of our uh, 31 intercollegiate programs to be able to go on an international trip once every four years, which is what the NCA allows. So we're focusing on how we can enrich those opportunities, how we can allow our student athletes the very, very best opportunities to what Penn State as a whole, academically and from an academy standpoint, has, uh, has to offer. Uh, sports science. You know, what's, what's, again, I keep talking about we owe these students, we owe these student athletes the opportunity to pursue the very, very best academically and the very, very best athletically. Because that's who they are. It's not one or the other for, for any of them. It's both. Uh, and, and again, that's, that's why they, they, they choose Penn State. So it's around, it's around sports science. You know, what is the latest and greatest in terms of helping them reach their physical potential, their, poten their, uh, their best potential in their sport. It's around best coaching. It's around best conditions for success. And that's where our facilities master plan uh, comes into place. Uh, as you look at our facilities master plan, it's around those 31 sports, 800 student athletes, and the approximately, depending on how you count, 19 facilities that they occupy <coughs> to train uh, and compete and, and learn in. Uh, and uh, that's where we've spent a lot of time around what, what do our students need uh, to be their very, very best selves academically and athletically. Again, we're going to open the Morgan Academic Center, the new consolidated Morgan Academic Center in the old Greenberg Ice Rink um, in June. Uh, I would encourage any and all of you to take an opportunity to come look at it. And that is again about giving our student athletes the best opportunity uh, to reach their potential academically. Uh, and each of one, each of them has a different academic potential. Uh, you know, you've got B students trying to be A students, you got C students trying to be B students, and you got some that are struggling a little bit, uh, trying trying to make their way um, through our, our, our difficult curriculum. Uh, so that then segues to financial stability. Stability, and what's that about? Uh, I, I've said it over and over and over again. Um, and we are our own worst enemies from an intercollegiate athletic standpoint in terms of talking about money talking about big television contracts, or talking about gate receipts, or those kinds of things. Bottom line is there's only one reason that we need to sell tickets or raise money. It's not to make money. It's to create resources to do all the things I just talked about in terms of creating those conditions for success. Uh, you know, Penn State is one of a handful of Division I universities across the country uh, that, is, uh, uh, that, that essentially funds itself. Uh, we, we, uh, we certainly aim to remain that way. We've got opportunities that allow us to do that. But we have 31 programs and 800 student athletes that, that I talked about. You know, we're trying to compete with a budget to resource 31 programs that is less than some universities who are maybe sponsoring 17, 18, 19, 20. Uh, but that's a principle that we hold, that that's a value uh, that is very, very important to us. We believe in a robust, diverse, uh, and, and very strong intercollegiate athletics program. Uh, but we have, we have to turn around and, and, and resource that. All of our indicators are that, that, uh, that we're headed in the, in the right direction from a philanthropy standpoint, from a, a ticket sales standpoint, from a corporate partner, partnership standpoint, merchandising, uh, media, uh, meaning the media rights 
you know, all of that is, is headed in the right direction. Uh, but again, we've, uh, you know, we've taken on, uh, from a financial standpoint, we've taken some hits, as well as taken on some additional financial burdens that weren't there, let's say, pre-2011. Uh, and we always need to be mindful of escalating costs. Um, you, you, we all use the term arms race. Um, you know, we can define that in, in many, many different ways. We compete for a living, uh, so there are certain things that we have to do uh, maybe to, to keep up. We have our own set of challenges from a financial standpoint. Um, it's very different to transport teams in and out of, of State College than let's say maybe it was uh, when I was at Cal to, to transport them in and out of, uh, of San Francisco or when I lived in Chicago, transporting them in, in and out of Chicago. So a lot of things to, uh, um, uh, to be uh, cognizant of there. We have to be really, really diligent uh, and smart about how we use uh, our, our resources. Uh, but again, not unlike some of the uh, financial burdens that we have taken on post-2011-2012, uh, we've also, in our competitive marketplace, cost of attendance was uh, a $1.75 million uh, expense um, once it uh, went into play in the, in the fall of two, uh, 2015. We're spending about $750,000 a year on our fueling stations and our other nutritional um, uh, type uh, initiatives once the NCA deregulated um, the, our ability to provide uh, food. Uh, some of us call it uh, un unlimited food. Um, I think that sounds a little uh, too over the top, so I prefer not to call it unlimited food, um, because certainly Penn State is not unlimited, but it is addressing the nutritional needs um, of our student athletes. So we have to examine you know, where, we're, where we're devoting our resources, um, to, to use a, a, a term that I, uh, I prefer not, not to use, but I think it's one that gets to the point, you know, return on investment. Uh, again, we're looking for return on investment so that we can use those resources to fund that student-athlete experience. Uh, you know, we, have, we have to look at the, at the way we go about our daily, uh, our daily lives. Uh, you know, Saturday afternoon was a great, great example of the Penn State community coming together. Um, Coach Franklin likes to refer to them as our family reunions. I think that's a great, uh, I think that's a great way to describe it. Uh, you know, the, 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 the vibe and the environment on Saturday around schools and colleges that were holding reunions or councils or, or whatever it was around our lettermen, around our current team, around other teams that, that fed off the, the blue-white experience off a record crowd at softball on both Saturday and, uh, and Sunday afternoon. Uh, the, our, uh, our lacrosse game last night under the lights uh, on, on BTN against Johns Hopkins. You know, those, those are the kinds of things that uh, really, I believe, bring value to this university uh, and, and help us uh, help us as a university connect and use interfleeted athletics um, a, as that vehicle. Uh, but you know, as you all very well know, uh, we do we do blue white without charging, uh, and that's about a 500. Uh, it's about half a million dollar uh, expense for us uh, for uh, for that Saturday. You know, so so how you know what is it our fans are looking for from a, from a value proposition? Uh, how might uh, we uh, we be able to do things that make it a, a less uh, resource intensive um, uh, initiative, but at the same time make sure that our fans have uh, ha have a great Saturday and that they uh, they have the opportunity to uh, to connect with us. So, you know, I would say um, uh, the, the number one thing for us is, is always our student athletes. Um, the academic performance uh, that, uh, that we see uh, year in and year out, semester in and semester out. You saw some, uh, some great news last uh, Wednesday, I believe, where five of our intercollegiate athletic programs were named as programs of distinction. Uh, the NCAA, that means you're top 10% uh, top in the APR data. Uh, in, uh, in your particular sport. Uh, I always tell our coaches, uh, you know, we can do better. Um, probably the only time uh, I, I don't have the ability to say that is when, uh, uh, when a women's tennis or a men's basketball or, or, uh, or a women's ice hockey have a 100% graduation rate. Well, you know what? I can't tell them to do better than that in that time frame, but I can tell them, good luck, here we go, you got a new time frame, you got to go do it again. 
right? Um, so just, uh, you know, incredible uh, student athletes, uh, incredible students that I know many, if not all of you, have the opportunity to, uh, to interact with. I'm really, really proud of how they represent us. Uh, as an institution, proud of what they're doing academically, proud of what they're doing in the community, uh, and, uh, and and we're winning more than our share as well. So uh, I think we're uh, although we always can do better. We can always be from a support standpoint looking how we help our student athletes be uh, uh, their very very best selves. Um, but I, I believe that. Uh, that they're, they're doing a great job in terms of representing this, this institution uh, and, uh, and those of us behind them. So, with that. Questions? I tried to talk for 45 minutes, but it didn't work. <laughs> Jordan. Sandy, I mentioned uh, with 800 student athletes across the board approximately, correct? Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, That's the number we use. Yes. It, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Every day it goes you know, up and out, up and out. Um, and obviously nutritional and workout programs are very individualized across the board. Um, I was wondering how individualized counseling, uh, mental health outreach, and also um, academics have become at this university. I would say that the approach is, is very similar. I mean, there's, there's hardly anything that one size uh, fits all. Uh, mental health is uh, is certainly something that I think is of grave concern across our entire population of student bodies on every campus. Um, we uh, we are really really fortunate um, in that we have a very active uh, uh, mental health task force um, that, uh, that that works with us from an athletic standpoint, and uh, and, and and they've been tremendous, uh, but. Not unlike for the entire student body, you know, we don't have enough resources. So um, athletics certainly is in discussion with with campus and with university health services and, and CAPS. How can how can we help? How can we help not only help uh, our student athlete population of 800, but how can we contribute to it and and help mental services, uh, mental health services throughout throughout the campus? But directly to your question, um, it's it's very individual. Uh, which also makes it very resource intensive then. Going along with the mental health task force kind of thing, do you have anything in line for concussion testing, tech task forces, or individualized things like that? Yeah, that's been well underway for several several years. Uh, we have some great research going on uh, on our own campus uh, through our, our uh, 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 College of HHD. Uh, as uh, as well as some partnerships with both other universities and some industry in, industry folks in terms of uh, measurement uh, and, and those kinds of things. And then obviously uh, we were uh, full proponents of what the Big Ten did. I believe it was a year ago in terms of the independent uh, independence model. Switching gears, you mentioned the facilities master plan a little bit. How is that going? I think it, it's it's going really really well. Um, you know, a lot of input from uh, a lot of different stakeholders. Um, kind of like I talked about here, you're, you're really talking about two uh, two different looks that we have to take at it. First of all, you look at the facilities from the standpoint of student athletes and 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 competition and training facilities. Do, where where are our gaps from from what we need there? Uh, and, and so that those are those are first on the list, and then the second part of uh, the approach would be uh, our fans. Uh, you know, what what are our fans looking for? What motivates uh, fans to come to a Jeffrey Field or a Sarney or obviously a Beaver Stadium or a BJC or a, or a Rec Hall? And uh, you know, what are what value do you find? What uh, what things do you do you want to see? What are what are the comforts? You're looking for, um, and what what price points uh, are, are you uh, are, are you willing to, to pay? So those are all the kinds of things that, that we've been collecting. I think we're looking at uh, we're looking at late summer for maybe some initial uh, some initial look at uh, at what the future might hold. Because again, the facilities master plan we're talking about a 15 or, or a 20 year uh, uh, look at that. Um, you, you talked about. Uh, adding all these extra facilities and stuff. And I agree, I think Penn State has world-class facilities, but then sometimes you hear stories in the news about Division I athletes going to bed hungry 
and not having money to buy meals, do you feel, what are your thoughts on student athletes being paid? Do you think that's the future of college athletics that students are going to get a piece of the pie? Uh, so let me let me address the, the latter part of your question about student athletes going to, to bed hungry. Um, you know that that was what the unlimited meals uh, was was meant to meant to address. And our student athletes who are on full scholarship uh, now receive tuition fees, room and board. Uh, so their their housing is paid for either if they're off campus, it's a it's an off campus it's a check to pay to help pay their rent or pay their rent. Um, and if they're on campus, it's it's on campus housing. And then a I believe it's a 21. Uh, meal per week plan. Um, so I, 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 the, the the young man that, that, that went to the podium in the final four and said he went to bed hungry. I talked to his athletic director, um, and he said, "Well, that's not really what he meant. He meant he was so tired sometimes he didn't just have the energy to go to to." Uh, and, and I said, "Well, um, so you know, we enacted a million dollars a year in, in legislation to respond to that because he was too tired to." You know, go to go to the dining hall. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I believe number one that need was not as severe as it might have as it might have been portrayed. Um, and secondly, we certainly uh, we certainly done that. I think the other piece that I have been uh, a uh, a proponent for many many years was the cost of attendance stipend. Um, at Penn State, that's four thousand seven hundred and thirty eight dollars uh, an academic year. All right, uh, they are our uh, our full ride student athletes are now uh, receiving that, uh, and uh, I was a proponent of that because I believed that student athletes were the only entity on campus that did not have access to cost of attendance. Every other student who applies and applies for financial aid could receive up to cost of attendance. Now there there is a difference there. Um, and that is one is based on need and, and one is not. But the athletic scholarship has never been necessarily based on, on need. So that's, the cost of attendance portion is no different uh, than, the, uh, than the other part. Um, I think once we've done that, uh, that our, our student athletes have access to the kinds of funds that they need um, to be able to in, engage in the education. And frankly, um, I believe that we're giving them uh, something far uh, more valuable in terms of setting up the, the rest of their life than, than compensation. Um, I, I, I don't want to call what they're getting compensation, but I, what they're getting is, is, a, is an, an investment, a very serious investment in the rest of their life. That, that prompted a lot of questions. Uh, Corey and then Jill. Well, say you mentioned this summer for some updates for the facilities master plan. With regards to Beaver Stadium, um, has a decision been made about renovating or rebuilding? And what, what kind of time frame would you would you think there might be for that kind of decision? Yeah, I would say a decision has not been made, but it's very very clear to me from the analysis that's been done, which is what I promised from the outset, um, that uh, uh, that rent renovation is, is the direction um, that that we need to to head in. Um, I think it's premature for us to, to understand the, what kind of a time frame we're talking about until we fully understand uh, what it is that we'll be attempting to do, what, what, what will be the extent of the renovations, and then what will be the cost, because certainly what we'll need to, uh, bef before we would be able to start any renovation, we'd need, we'd need to have plans uh, from a financing standpoint. On the, uh Back to the paying of the athlete mm -hmm. on the licensing of of likeness and name it, name likeness and image. Yes. Where 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 do you guys stand on that and the discussions with the NCAA on that? Yeah, obviously that litigation is uh, is ongoing. Uh, but again, I I, I believe uh, that we're making a that, that Penn State University is making a significant. Um, investment uh, in our student athletes and, and, and in their future, uh, and that that's in, in terms of the collegiate model and in terms of the academy that that's that's where we that's where we got to stand. That's right. Along those lines, no doubt the scholarship has a, a lot of value, uh, undoubtedly. But some of these athletes clearly do have more value than than what they're getting. I mean, if a Christian Hackenberg could have gotten paid for autographs, he would have gotten paid for autographs. 
um, student, the, the average student body can get paid professionally if they are, when I was at the, the student newspaper, I got paid from the student newspaper or work professionally as a freelancer. So why should college athletes then not be able to see, get their value, and maybe their highest value for some of them, at that moment? And I think that's probably where the gray area will, will come a little bit, is in uh, how they are now being restricted against certain activities that they then could go out and do on their own, as opposed to what Penn State should be providing for them or, or, or paying for them. I think that's where the discussion uh, are, are, will, are you open will, to that? will come. Would you, you open like players? get paid for autographs, players get some sort of endorsements. Yeah, I think I think there, there are a number of restrictions and a number of rules from an NCA standpoint that don't make a lot of sense in today's world. Go ahead. See, I've always wondered, in baseball, high school prospects are allowed to consult with agents, negotiate salaries, and then retain NCAA as an eligibility. In football and basketball, it seems that athletes Look at an agent. Uh, their eligibility is in question. Why is not quite, but close. Well, why, why is there a difference between those sports? And hockey is another example where you have teams who are drafted or players who are drafted and still retain eligibility. Yeah, and there, there's no doubt we've got to, we've got to clean that up because those principles are the same for that for that student and the, and that family. Where do I get advice? How, how do I know I'm making a, a good decision? The one that's out of our hands is. Uh, are the actual draft eligibility rules by um, by professional sport? Those are done through collective bargaining uh, with those uh, with those players associations. I would love for those to have to, to, to have a little bit more continuity uh, or, or, or consistency uh, amongst them. Uh, we hear a lot about uh, about one and one and done, which used to be none and done. Uh, and then we changed it to one, some would like two, some would like three. Uh, I, I think if we can't increase it to at least two, if not three, I'm talking the, I'm talking the NBA, I'm talking basketball now, then we ought to go back to none. Uh, because I think what, what you're, some of what you're seeing in some places uh, is, a, is a true subversion of, of the academic mission. And uh, I think we have to acknowledge maybe at some point that not everyone is interested in going to college, uh, and 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 we're making them do that from uh, uh, from a basketball standpoint. Would you be in favor of adopting something similar to baseball, where you can be drafted out of high school, uh, and then if you decline the contract, you go to college, but you have to stay for at least three years before entering the draft again? I actually think the baseball rule is the best one. You have a point where you make it, where you have a, the opportunity to make a decision, and then if you make the decision to go to college, then you're you know, you're at least two legs and hopefully waist deep in. So. Lisa, again, I'm from Maryland, you're from State. So, um, and you talked about that, that the term return on investment was an interesting one. We do follow a lot of the, um, the athletic programs and facilities and coaches. At what point, as an athletic director, are you not getting that return on investment? Because obviously, the winning football program at the state helps drive about the line. But one year over 500 in the last few years. At what point, where are you saying you have to start thinking about the change? Well, that's one of the reasons I hesitate to, to use the term return on investment because I don't I don't believe that it's it's strictly a uh, you know pen and paper numbers mm -hmm. calculation. Um, of all the places I've been, this is this is a place, and, and again, this last weekend was a perfect example of uh, intercollegiate athletics serving as a conduit or an opportunity for our community, our family, to, to gather and enjoy their their connectedness. Uh, so I, I I think when when I use the term ROI, um, you know, it's mainly around a, a, an expense standpoint. Uh, no business in America would run the way we do with essentially two, uh, two revenue centers and, and 29 cost centers, although we do have several other in there that are, that are very, very close to, uh, it to at least breaking even. Uh, so, you know, we, we measure that in, in, in a lot of different ways. Obviously, your question was uh, around football. And, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I think that uh, you know, from a football standpoint, people people need to uh, people need to understand the impact of of the scholarship limitations. 
uh, and, uh, and and you know what what the what that impact was and is and and will continue to be for for some time uh, and where we realistically can be. Having said that, I am really really and I was before Saturday, uh, but I'm I'm very uh, very excited about where we're going. Um, obviously, Coach Franklin and his staff have recruited very very well, um, but frankly, they've done a lot of really, really good things in the classroom and in the community uh, and, and, and with these young men, and, and I, I couldn't be more excited about what we're doing. I'm going to give it to a student, Brian. <clears throat> I just want to go back to cost attendance. I apologize if you're touching this, but uh, when that rule came down by the NCAA a couple years ago, they kind of left it up to the individual schools in terms of how much money you want to give each full ride scholarship. Um, students, you said that um, Penn State gives that $4,738. I just kind of wondering how you got that number. Yeah, so Penn State Athletics did not get to that number, um, and, and I think your statement is a little bit, little bit of, a, of a misnomer. It is left to each institution. Um, athletics has nothing to do with that. There is a federal financial aid formula and number that, or the formula that each institution uses to come up with its own number. So the four thousand seven hundred thirty-seven, I think, is the minimum, is the cost of attendance figure for every student on campus, and so it's it's the one that uh, that we're allowed to use. We we would be allowed to give up to that. Sure, that help? Mm -hmm. Other than the appeals of history and tradition, in 2016, what are the arguments against the Big Five football conferences breaking away from the NCAA and going on their own? Um, well, I, I, I wouldn't even go on tradition. I, you know, I, I would go to avoid chaos. Um, you know, what, what, what about it's not working and how do we address those in, in our current state? Or, you know, with, without breaking away, how, how do we address the, the, the issues and the problems? Bottom line is, and, and particularly around satellite camps, I can't believe no one's brought up satellite camps yet. Um, you, you've heard, you know, all oh, the NCAA did this. The NCAA is added again. Um, now, obviously, we have our own history uh, at Penn State with, with the NCAA. But, uh, you know, those votes in, uh, in, the, uh, in the council last week were athletic directors, faculty reps, and senior women's administrators from institutions across the country. So we're going to take those same people and move them to some new structure, and what's going to change? Let's fix what we got. But, but, but if you were starting over, there's no way the big five football conferences would be married to everybody else, would it? I, 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 don't, I don't know. that I, I, I wouldn't jump right to that answer. I mean, yes, this, is, this is about college sports. The NCAA was created for you know historical reasons to avert a crisis about a century ago, and so I mean this kind of that's a really difficult point in the in the it was a it was a it was a created to address a problem at a specific moment, and then and then we go from there. So I mean you you, you have in some ways um, very similar problems that that the college athletic world is facing now. Dave Rebson, who's uh, a panelist later has written a book about that, and you know the the original NCAA was dealing with with this enormous injury crisis, and now we're in the middle of an enormous injury crisis, and so it might work out to be quite similar. Just it's 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 just really. I, I guess my point is I don't know that breaking away solves anything. Uh, Sandy, um, how do you feel about the? Uh, satellite camps. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I do think it's a shame. Uh, I, I, I do think it's a shame on a, on a number of different levels. Uh, you know, one is uh, that there's <laughs> there's no doubt that the ACC and and the SEC uh, were you know their opposition is uh, is around trying to protect uh, an inherent advantage that they have. And that's fine. I, I, I get that. Um, I do think that probably the, um, 
the thing that prior to the vote that got undersold or was was the the FCS or the the non Power Five schools, uh, you know what what they were, what benefits they were reaping. Again, in terms of seeing student athletes, um, and I, I I think we we completely undersold what we are now hearing from students about their opportunities. I don't think that was on anybody's radar really uh, that was trying to trying to shut it down. Um, we'll we'll see what's gonna happen. Um, I mean obviously the rules are rule, we'll 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 abide by it. Um, I think Penn State is a uh, uh, is uh, you know is well known enough. It's a big enough brand, if you will, uh, that uh, that there's not going to be any significant harm to to us. Um, but I do think it's a it's a shame that uh, that students who otherwise might not have the opportunity. And as we all know, recruiting in in every sport is 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 escalating. Um, and um, you know we might have to make some rule changes around earlier or earlier visits to uh, to help alleviate that. We've got just a, just an FYI to everybody. We got about five minutes to go. So, seeing along those lines, do you think there's any chance the board of directors overturns it when they need to be in Vermont? Uh, I think there's a chance. Have you heard that talk? Uh, there's, there's been there's been there's been lots of talk, and uh, I, I certainly think that there's there's a chance. Uh, my guess would be they won't. Uh, they'll they'll go with the with the will of the council, but uh, we'll see. It's obviously gotten a lot of play. Uh, Cindy, I don't know if you have the agenda for today, but at 115 we have a uh, segment on overcoming limited access. Um, in Pittsburgh, of all the teams that we cover, no institution limits our access more than Penn State, um, specifically Penn State football. Uh, there's a rule in place that if our reporter wants to talk to the parents of players, we have to have it cleared through the institution, which doesn't exist with any other team we cover, high school, college, or pro. So I'll ask you, how do you characterize Penn State's relationship with the media, and how can you improve it? Well, you'll have you'll have to you'll have to tell me. Uh, you know, I, I uh, I'm surprised to hear what what you just said in terms of we're the most restrictive, um, because I certainly and I'm uh, I feel like Penn School in Maryland, same thing. I mean, I deal with Orioles, Ravens. Yeah. Maryland districts as an access person. Yeah, so I, I think there's a theme there in terms of your, it, it, I assume you're talking, about, you're talking about student athletes and you're talking about parents. I mean, I fully support the, 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 the parent role. They're, you know, they're not in, they're not in this every day. Uh, and so all we're here to do is give them some, uh, some advice, some, if they, if they have questions. We're just doing with the parents the exact same thing we're doing with the student athletes, or the you know I get contacted by the media. Some of you have my cell phone numbers. Thank you very much. Um, I'm I'm turning it over to, to Jeff and our media relations department to handle. I'm happy to talk to you, uh, but it's it's going to go through. It's going to go through somebody. Um, yeah, but we deal with high school athletes. We get relationships with their parents and the athletes mm -hmm. growing up. So they go to college and we're just not supposed to talk to the parents? I mean, come on. And, and it's okay for high school athletes to talk to us and they get to college and they can't? Well, I, when they're I don't, more mature. I don't control the high schoolers, but I, I, if, I were, if I were the parent of a, of a high school student athlete, I would want that same, I would want that same protection. I mean, I mean, college, but again, it's not, it's not saying you can't talk to them, it's just you've got to go through a process. Yeah, but Say there's a story that breaks on a Thursday night, and you have to try and get you have to try and get approval to go talk to a parent. Yeah, I, well, I just don't. Sense. I just don't. I don't agree with your premise that yeah. it's not happening, and therefore it's okay. That's all. Jordan, I understand your frustration, but yeah. Cindy, obviously this is an uh, important topic to many of us in here, and, sure. and it causes some kind of discussion. What do you think the chances are of university outreach and dialogue with media members to uh, hear both sides of things and maybe surveying or having kind of more discussions like this so that you can really build a relationship to the media and the program? I think discussion is all, always good. Um, because again, like, like what just, I, I understand your frustration. 
Uh, but I also hope you understand what we're, what we're trying to do. And if more discussion helps us come to a better place, fantastic. Sure. I just wonder what you're trying to protect the athlete from. Um, what is it? Well, we want to, okay, I'll just, as an athletic director, mm -hmm. if I'm going to talk to the media, I want to be prepared. I, I want to make I want to make sure you know what is it what is it you're looking for uh, you know our folks in media relations or maybe Phil Aston my deputy you know I need some more information on that so that I can be I can speak intelligently on on the issue it's it's to me it's about preparation and our student athletes and our parents are are the you know are, have, have the least information. But the students don't have that rule. We want to talk to Ben Roethlisberger's parents. So, I mean, they're both adults, they're both dealing with high-profile athletes. I mean, you know, the Steelers allow us much more access than Penn State. I mean, what, I guess... My, my, my question is, yes, it's it's a different process, but how does it end up being less access? Well, like, we're generally told no as well. Yeah. Or we put it this way, right. you know, we, we have the University of Pittsburgh, time. we have Penn State University. Uh, during spring practice, our pit reporters could watch 30 minutes of every practice, uh, three to four times a week. At Penn State, we had 10 minutes of access a week. That was on Wednesday night. So th that's that's what I'm saying. I'm talking about limited access. It's, it's okay. So it's it's beyond just one on one talking to yes. talking folks. Let me just say we got we got one minute left. <laughs> well, like for us, sometimes it hurts us because, like, <coughs> the Lock Haven Express, we're right down the road, and we have, we cover five high schools, and we have kids that come up and play at Penn State. Well, the Lock Haven Express isn't the same thing as Colleen Senior from the Post Gazette, and sometimes when we're looking for stories that we want to get out at a certain time, it hurts our access because we might not be the ones that are on, that are on the top of the list saying we need to get you this person to talk to. And that's sometimes where it can hurt us. Yeah. So I think that's where, where Jordan's thought about. You know, let's let's figure out where the where the problems are and how do how do we maintain the 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 concerns we have and yet get you timely and, and, and access to what you know from a from a watching practice standpoint, um, you know, I have I have to respect our coaches and and how they're gonna run their programs from that standpoint. Um, the more of the one-on-one -on -one and, and content of stories from a one-on-one -on -one standpoint, I, I think we, I think we probably will. Great, Sandy. Thank you so much right. for, for being here. I need, I need to give you all directions. Um, we're we're headed to the Dean's Hall One room uh, for lunch.